Well, I will. And I, I think that... Look, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open them right now to 1 Corinthians 14. I'd like you to look at a text. Because in the Reformed community, I think they misdefine prophecy, actually. You know, I just had a a missionary friend who's serving the Lord in China visit here in the United States and he was in our home and he said that his fear is that the preaching ministry in the United States of America is losing its prophetic element. Can I tell you something? John Piper has said, and maybe some of you have heard it, he prays for the gift of of prophecy every time he goes into the pulpit. What, what's he, what are these guys talking about? Many in the Reformed community would say prophesying is nothing different than preaching. I would take issue with that because I don't think that's what Paul means. And I'm going to show you. If you're in 1 Corinthians 14, I would have you look where he begins talking specifically about prophesying. Verse 19, Nevertheless, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And he keeps going on. He talks about tongues. Um, verse 24, If all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God, declare that God is really among you. What then, brothers? When you come together, each as a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, and an interpretation, let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be, and he goes on with that. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. Now, here it is. Verse 30. I want you to see something about what Paul believes prophesying is. He says, if a revelation... Now notice, verse 29, he's speaking about prophets. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another, another aside from who? From the first prophet speaking. If there's a revelation made to a second or a third prophet sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Now what I would have you guys understand and see is that in verse 30, if a revelation is made to another sitting there. Here's the picture. You have one prophet speaking. Others are sitting there weighing what's said. And a revelation is made to one of the prophets sitting there. Now what I'd have you understand is this. What Paul means by prophesying right there is not something pre-studied, pre-learned, premeditated upon, it is something revealed right there. Now when this missionary just was here and he said he's afraid that we're losing a prophetic element, let me tell you something. I believe a prophetic element has come back into the church by men like Piper and by men like Washer. There is a prophetic element. In other words, things are being revealed which are not necessarily studied. Now, you know the Reformed community tends to call it things like light on their feet. Oh, they're scared to death of the terminology prophesying just as much as they're scared of tongues. But they might have a different name for it, but I'll tell you, the Puritans believed in it. They might have called it by a different name. They might have called it... They called it something... What do they call it? The spirits. Something of that nature. But you know, you read Spurgeon's autobiography, you see that he had gifts of it. You listen to Paul Washer, you see that he's had gifts of it. You listen to John Piper, you see that he's had gifts of it. 
you listen to this certain missionary from from uh, China, you see that he's had gifts of it. What, what is this? It's things that God reveals to us. It's a Spurgeon basically declaring something that he could not otherwise know to be true. Just declare, It's Paul Washer saying somebody's going to come into this auditorium and seek to break up this service. And he's thinking, why did I say that? And somebody breaks in through the doors and tries to break up the thing. It's Spurgeon saying something about somebody in the audience and that he couldn't otherwise know and it turns out to be true. It's John Piper saying that as he's preaching, all of a sudden things are revealed to his mind and afterwards people come up to him and say, I really appreciated that message. Well, what was it that helped you so much? Bang, right there. The part of that message that he's saying, God gave that to me right there in the pulpit. That is a prophetic ministry. It is God giving us a word, sometimes a word that's been forgotten that the church needs. Sometimes it's things that couldn't otherwise be known. It tends to be that which is helpful for the immediate context of the church. It's comforting. It's edifying. It's not equal to the canon of Scripture. It is not. In fact, Paul says that if you, you know, right there at the end of the chapter, if you guys are really prophets, then let, then you know what? Basically, basically approve of what I'm saying, that it's, it's indeed the Word of God. In other words, you know what? Prophets are subject to prophets. But it's as though Paul says apostles are not subject to the prophets. In fact, the prophets need to be subject to the apostles. And he says, I taught this, and if you truly are prophetic, then prophesy this, approve this. I mean, basically certify this, that what I'm saying is indeed the Word of God. It's true. And so, you know, basically what we find is the apostles, they spoke on the authority of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that there wasn't a place to have a Berean spirit and compare Scripture with what these guys were saying. But on the same level, prophets... You know, we basically had prophets like Agabus. Various prophets came along. We know that not everything they said was equivalent to Scripture because Agabus was called a prophet and we only know like one of the prophecies that he spoke and yet he was called a prophecy. He was called a prophet even before he made that prophecy. Clearly, Paul is implying that people at Corinth would function just the way he's saying. Clearly, Paul's implying that a multiplicity of prophets would function at Corinth. We don't have a single one of their prophetic utterances, which tells us it's not on the level of canon. It's not on the level of, if one of these prophets has a word of God, we need to record it in the Bible. When Paul Washers had a word from God, when these sisters over in the Hebrides revival had a word from God, when... when Spurgeon has had a word from God. It's not of the same caliber. It hasn't had to be recorded in Scripture. It's basically God working through a certain New Testament giftedness that really is very helpful for the church. And Paul says, we ought to to desire that gift. That it's... You know, I think this missionary from China has has a real concern to say that his fear is that the preaching loses its prophetic utter element. You know what he's worried about? That the preaching in this country basically becomes academic. That we just become a bunch of scribes standing in the pulpit rehashing what other men have already taught. And that we're not getting a fresh word from God. You know, McShane said that, did he not? We get our words, we get our thoughts from God, those who preach the Word. May God give us that prophetic element because of a lot of unbelief. Men are scared to death of it. But we need it. We need it in this day and age. And so, brother, that may not have been the answer that you wanted or were expecting, but the text there in 1 Corinthians 14 seems to indicate that what Paul is talking about prophetically is a revelation. It is something not studied. It is something revealed to a man as he's sitting there. And so, that I, I mean, I can't. Well, no, I just know that there's like people who, you know, they say you're going to get a new house and God told me to tell you, and they give these 
may, you know, in 30 days, something may happen to a country somewhere in the world. And, you know, it's just real vague and it can hit or miss and so on. See, I've seen New Testament prophecy. I mean, I'll tell you that I, I know one guy that God all of a sudden gave him a word that, that the guy he was working with was involved in adultery. He confronted him. It was true. I know a man who God gave him a word that a man that had gone out of our church over to Korea was involved in a cult. A week later, he found out exactly it was true. I mean... You know, when it, what I have found is that these men who have a prophetic gift, they're right. And they're specific and they're right. And it's not all these vaguenesses that can't be verified. I mean, test the spirits. It says don't despise prophesying, does it not? In 1 Thessalonians 5. And it also right after that says we're supposed to test everything. And I would say that. We need to test things. Again, I would come back to this. You know what? If somebody's telling me they have this gift, but I know that guy. He's not the most honest guy. Sometimes it's hard to believe what he says. I'm not going there. If this guy is a guy that he is spotless and blameless in his reputation, he starts telling me he's gotten a word from God, I'm going to listen. We need to test the spirits. Who, who is this coming from? And basically a little bit of examination and uh, I mean, I've known somebody before that told me that they had a word from the Lord, and I began to inquire a little bit. And you know what? It stood up to the biblical gift. And I don't question it to this day. I think it's very valid. I, I've, I've seen it. And so, but I also know we got a lot of quacks out there, and we got a lot of people that, you know, they, they would love to have the applause, and they would love to be seen to be big in people's eyes. They want to be men pleasers and men. Um, they want to perform before men and they're, they really want to be seen as some great one. And so they... What, that's another thing I've seen. When you have true spiritual gifts that are unusual and unique, God typically attends it with an extra dose of humility. And what I have typically found is men with the gift of prophecy have never declared themselves prophets. They typically are humble. They're low key. They're, um, you know, that's another thing to look out for. If you if you got a guy that's just arrogant and he's full of pride and he tells you he's got some gift like this, I'd be saying, you know, I'm not so sure you do. Any other comments, questions? I do. Um. When it says uh, above, uh, above all gifts, we should desire the gift of prophecy, is it like in that context? In which talk, context? When, when, when Paul's talking about the gifts, um, uh, when it says uh, we, we, we should desire the gift of prophecy. Yeah, he basically says it like this. He says, pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. That's how he puts it. So, if the look, if an apostle says, especially, we should be desiring prophetic utterance. You can be certain it's valuable to the church. And I think this man who just recently said that that's his fear we're losing a prophetic element. I know this man you'll find few men that have character equal to his. And for him to have that fear, and for him to have that desire, I, you know, I think we've lost that desire. Isn't it amazing how much the Scripture says that we just ignore? And yet, there's something God, speaking through His Apostle, tells us today, desire this, if you're going to talk about spiritual gifts, this is the one to desire. And yet in so many circles, it's not only not desired, it's despised. It's feared. That's, uh, that's amazing. If we would just take Scripture at face value, but we have, we have all these presuppositions, we have all these traditions, we have all sorts of reformed camp type people that are scared to death of the supernatural, and so, 
we become disarmed. Th these certain academic reformed camps would disarm us of so much of the New Testament. Brothers and sisters, don't let that happen. Oh, we, hold on to your doctrines of grace. I'm not telling you to move out of that camp. But don't let the academic Calvinists disarm you of the Scriptures. Let's be what the Scripture tells us to be and let's do what the Scriptures tell us to do and let's desire what the Scriptures tell us to desire. Anything else?